Dawn of Zombies is still in the beta process, but Royal Ark is creating new content at impressive speeds. The game has great graphics, an intriguing storyline to find out who you are, and a clever structure for player progression. But it can also be a very difficult game if you do not know what you are doing, so today Royal Ark has sponsored me to give you 218 tips and tricks for their game. The first thing you need to know is that during the Dawn of Zombies, a huge fire took place which messed with the fabric of time. This can cause some events to reset while others remain constant. So let me explain real quick the five different types of zones. The first zone that you interact with is Riveter and Sherp's shelter. Sherp is your friend and the only one that knows your true identity and he is missing when you arrive. But he leaves you with a note saying that you are in charge of building up the shelter's workbenches and defenses until he sends you more clues. This location never resets which allows you to keep your progress as you build and expand the space. Currently your base is the only location of this type, but I think Royal Ark has plans to add more in the future. The second type of locations are resource zones. Currently there are three different difficulty levels of forest zones and three corresponding junkyard zones. These zones are rich with lots of resources, but it's important to note that they reset as soon as you leave them. This is mostly a good thing because it allows you to go back to them over and over again to get more resources, but it can also be a bad thing because if you allow yourself to die in one of these zones, then you will never get your stuff back. The third type of location are zones that are always there, but reset on a timer. Right now the warehouse is the only one of these type of zones in the game, but it is arguably the most important zone since it is key to finishing your bicycle, which unlocks the whole new aspect of the game. I will not have time in this video to cover all the details on how to do the warehouse and get your bicycle, so if that interests you, make sure to check out my video on the fastest way to get your bicycle. The motorcycle, UAZ, and T16 do not exist yet in the game, but I have a feeling that when they are added, the developers will add more of these types of locations to the game. The fourth type of location are events. Events will appear after a certain amount of time when you enter your world map. If you haven't logged in for a while, I would recommend going in and out of the world map because sometimes you can spawn up to three events at one time. Each event has a specific purpose in the game, which I will be explaining each of those purposes a little later on in this video. Currently, there are six types of events in the game, but Royal Ark has stated plans to add quite a bit more. And lastly, the fifth type of location are storyline events which will appear when you get to that place in the storyline and won't disappear until you complete your objective for that storyline quest. So those are the five different types of events. The second thing you need to know when playing Dawn of Zombies is that most of the enemies and loot in those locations change as you pass through the five different tiers of the game. These five tiers each have their own set of armor and weapons which are significantly better than the previous tier, but they also require better resources to craft them. The first time you will notice a change in loot is when you hit level 32 and enter the second tier of the game. All of a sudden the boxes that you have been farming over and over again in the resource zones will have additional higher quality items. You can then use those items for those higher level crafting recipes and upgrading your workbenches. After that, new items will be added to the game every few levels which keeps the zones interesting as you level up. For more information about the five different tiers and how to max out your account, make sure to check out my video called the four steps to becoming pro. Okay, so now that you understand the different types of locations and the five different tiers of progression, we can get into our walkthrough. When you first arrive, Riveter will start giving you a bunch of quests. Go ahead and do the first 15 of these quests because they are designed to help you understand the game. But after you unlock the Vultures Camp quest, it is best to slow down the storyline and take a few trips to the resource zone. At this point, you will notice that your personal digital assistant has a Geiger counter on it. When you click on a zone, this Geiger counter will show you how much radiation that zone has. Areas with higher levels of radiation will also increase your personal radiation level. When it hits 30, you will start taking 2 damage every 30 seconds. And then when it hits 99, you will start taking 20 damage a second. So it is important to manage those levels, but more importantly, areas with high levels of radiation have stronger enemies. So I recommend staying in the green zones for a little while. The first time you visit the green zone, you will see a player with a bike. This is not a real player because Dawn of Zombies does not have real multiplayer yet. But they do plan to add it, so AI players like this one are good placeholders. You will also see this NPC who gives you a few small quests. This guy is just here to help you learn how to farm the zone because it's your first time. After you leave the zone, the resources will reset, but he will be gone. So the second time you enter a zone, I recommend putting your character on auto. Auto in this game is incredible. Not only will it fight all the enemies, but it will loot every box in the area. 
you. All you have to do is make sure he has the tools that he needs and that he heals. The only downside of doing this is that you can't get sneak attacks on enemies, but sneak attacks only do double damage and it costs two energy every time you press the sneak button. So it's pretty much never worth sneaking in the green zone. As you watch your character on auto, you will notice that a lot of other things require energy. Every time you do a chopping or smashing action costs one energy and looting a box costs three. If you use too much energy, then you will end up not being able to run home. So a big part of this game is learning how to manage your energy. There are a lot of ways to do this and it can be kind of complicated. So if you want to master managing your energy, make sure to check out my video called Energy in Profusion. If for some reason you don't have time to watch that video, the three easiest ways to manage energy is to never eat food unless you are low on energy, make sure to always have enough energy to travel home, and then try to get to level 34 as quickly as possible so that you can build the wooden bed and sleeping bag combo, which gives you one energy every six seconds. So of course, I go into more detail on those things and cover more tricks in that video. At the time I'm making this video, Dawn of Zombies can be played completely free to play. There might be some things that seem difficult, but if you play smart, you can accomplish everything in the game without spending money. I don't know about you guys, but when I find a game that is set up like that, it makes me want to spend five to ten dollars just to support the devs. So if you are like me and it's within the first 24 hours of playing, I recommend buying the Kickstart package for three dollars because it gives you a tier two backpack, which gives you that five extra slots for collecting loot. You will get one of these for free on the 14th day of playing, but again, the reason I bought this pack was because I wanted to support the devs. It's not even as good of a deal as the emergency stock, which gives you a ton of stuff for just 50 cents more. But personally, having a higher tier backpack makes the game more fun for me, so that's why I chose the Kickstart package. That being said, if you are a free-to-play player that plays smart, you will have no trouble succeeding at this game. Doing the one-hour challenge and daily quest will give you amazing rewards each day, and there are several ways to earn gold in the game, so you can even activate premium pretty often. On that note, if you activate premium, it lasts exactly 48 hours. So I recommend doing it halfway through a day so that you can get premium quests and rewards for three different days in that 48 hour time span. After you've done those quests and farmed the green zone around nine times, or six if you have the higher tier backpack, I think you are ready to do your first event. Now the devs released this graphic saying that you should start in the green until you're able to move to the yellow and then do the red and then you can do the warehouse and other events. But I do not recommend that approach for a couple reasons. The first reason is because you can get almost everything you need to build and upgrade your workbenches from the green zone. You might have to go to the yellow and red zone every once in a while, but that doesn't happen very often until you get into the second or even third tier, which by then the yellow and red zones give better loot anyways. If you're ever unclear on where to find something, make sure to use the where to look button, even if you already think you know where to find it, because sometimes it will surprise you. The second reason I don't recommend using their approach is because as you level up, many of the events become more difficult. This is especially true of the warehouse because the Carnifex, which is the most difficult part of the warehouse, gets more health, does more damage, and heals a lot more. So it's actually best to do it as many times as you can at a lower level. Because of this, I recommend doing the warehouse as soon as you can craft four sharpened rebar and gather a decent set of armor, which is usually around the time you hit level 18. Before you head over to the warehouse, I recommend clicking on the settings button and then interface and then turning on the target switch button. This will allow you to switch targets during combat, which is incredibly helpful when fighting more difficult battles. When you try to travel to the warehouse, it will warn you not to enter the zone until you have better weapons and armor, but you can ignore this by just closing out of the warning and trying again. If you do this, make sure to bring the Makarov pistol that your base starts with. Use that pistol when you need to kill the Carnifex, and then use your sharpened rebar for all other enemies. Also, make sure that that pistol does not completely break. Get it down to a sliver, and then store it in one of your boxes reserved for almost broken weapons. When you unlock your basement and finish your upgrade bench, you will be able to pair those almost broken weapons with upgrade boxes to get a new full durability weapon that is significantly better than the one you originally had. That being said, upgrade boxes are much rarer than weapons, so unless you are spending money buying upgrades, then I recommend only using upgrade boxes on these 11 weapons. These are, in my opinion, the best weapons to upgrade of each tier because they either do the most damage or they have the most functionality and still do a lot of damage. I also recommend reserving your armor upgrades mainly for jackets, but sometimes shirts and pants. If you play efficiently, you will almost never have a full set of same tier 
your armor, so there is rarely a need to upgrade shoes and hats. While we're talking about the upgrade bench, I recommend moving it to a level 1 floor so that you can utilize this level 2 floor for workbenches that you are trying to upgrade. Or you can build more level 2 floors, but that costs a lot of rebar, which is in high demand when you are a lower level. You can also move your bicycle station out of this section of your house to free up those four level 2 floors. If you do this, you will not need to build a level 2 floor until you are level 62. I also recommend just deleting this shelf because it isn't very good. Next to that shelf is the artifact table which you cannot move to a level 1 floor. Once you repair the artifact table, you will be able to identify artifacts. You will want to trade some of these artifacts into the trader at the warehouse to help speed up how fast you get your bike, but you also need to keep in mind that artifacts are some of the most powerful items in the game. For example, one blood groove can theoretically heal over 12,000 hit points. By the time you get to the quest to fix the decoder, you will notice a bunch of unique items that can only be obtained at certain events. The slowest ones of these items to get are the three glares because they are found in the mysterious basement, which spawns less often than the other events. The first time you do the mysterious basement, you will find some throwing rocks to kill the firefly aberration, but after your first time, you will need to bring your own. You can also find glares at AI bases, but they are extremely rare, so it's easier just to wait for another mysterious basement. The the abandoned cabin and bandit camp are essentially the same event. They don't seem that difficult when you first get to them, but as soon as you touch the bandit's beloved bag of swag, you will get ambushed by several enemies, including a mini boss. After killing those enemies, you will get to loot their swag, which includes a vacuum tube and several unidentified artifacts. These two events are a little bit different than the others in the fact that once you leave, they immediately disappear. The besieged house is one of the most common events. In this event, you will help a farmer and his wife defend their home from the decayer. As you kill decayers, they will drop tag, which you can then trade with the farmer for loot boxes once the event is completed. This event is amazing for getting lots of healing items, but also halfway through the event you get two pre-war glue, which is needed for the decoders table. As you play the game, I recommend keeping as many types of healing items in your inbox so that you can use them to heal the farmer when he takes too much damage. It is also helpful to note that sometimes your progress is saved when opening a chest, so you don't have have to open it all at once when trying to get the pre-war glue. You also don't have to finish the event if your only purpose for doing it was to get the glue. The fifth event is the trader, which can happen at least four times a day. Trading is almost always worth it, so it is helpful to build up your reputation with them so that you make more trades. When building that reputation, it is helpful to note that the amount of reputation you get has an exponential relationship with how expensive the item you are buying is. So counterintuitively making more expensive trades is the most cost-effective way of building up your reputation. You can also see a list of what items you need to trade by going to your radio when the trader appears. You can also get a list of items needed to trade with the engineer, but you cannot go to the engineer until you finish your bicycle. I explain a lot of this in my other video about the bicycle, but one thing to keep in mind is that extra spokes and gear sprockets are often used to trade with the engineer. So you will want to keep extras that you have left over after crafting your bicycle. Tape also becomes more valuable after you finish your bicycle, so make sure not to throw that away either. When you do end up getting your bike and you are trading with the engineer, you will get bike attachments that either buff you or give you active skills. Do not delete duplicate bike attachments that you like. Those attachments will eventually need to be replaced because they operate on a durability system. Okay, so that should get you guys started, but in addition to those 193 tips, I have 25 more for you. Using normal wood only burns for two minutes, whereas quality plastic planks burn for four minutes, so process your wood before burning it. Also, switching the type of wood halfway through cooking will reset the bar, so don't do that. When farming a zone, put your lowest level axes at the top of your inventory so that your character will save the higher level ones for the higher level stuff. Performing a sneak attack from a bush gives you a much bigger attack range. I mentioned earlier that sneak attacks aren't that great for new players because they need to save their energy, but as you level up, it can sometimes be more efficient to use sneak attacks. When you are just getting started, your workbenches can't keep up with the resources you bring in, so make sure to use your quick items like grass seeds while you are playing, and save the slow items like wheat for when you are sleeping. You can stack the healing you get from food up to five times, making some food items faster at healing than bandages. You can also stack poison and burning damage on enemies up to five times. The best way to get rid of radiation is to kill yourself. Sometimes it's also best to do that when you get hungry. You will get lots of 
remove crowbars from traders, so use them to farm the green zone, which will also let you get further into cars. Don't farm wood, metal, or stone at yellow or red zones because it is far more cost effective to just do the green zone multiple times. As I touched on earlier, the yellow and red zones slowly give you radiation, so try to move quickly. As long as you travel to an event before the time expires, you can stay there as long as you need. Drinking potions will give you the glass bottle back, so usually when you're starting off, that is the best way to get glass bottles so that you can build the lab when it first becomes available. Keep as much as possible in your inbox. This will save space in your house, can save you in desperate situations, and eventually it will help you protect your stuff in multiplayer. Also try to keep your stuff in your workbenches as long as possible so that when you get a quest to complete a certain item, you can complete it quickly. When a quest has items for you to loot, like say a dead body, make sure to take those items before turning in that quest or all that loot will disappear. After fixing your base's crossbow defense, place it near the zombie spawn point so that it immediately kills the intruders. The crossbow has HP, but the zombies don't seem to actually damage it. The hunter necklace is an awesome accessory because it gives you 20% more hit points, but make sure to take it off when you're healing when you can so that you can get that extra 20% in your healing. Food that makes you thirsty can be really annoying to use, so save them up until you have a lot of them. Then when you need to heal with them, pop five at once to get all five stacks, and then use a water or normal food to prevent taking thirst damage. Keep repeating this process until you run out of them. Loot from trader boxes gets better as you level up, so save some of them if you can. This does not work for quest rewards or the one hour challenge. And then lastly, Sherp left you a cache in the basement, which includes a Glock. Well, that's it guys. Hope that helps. If you can think of anything that I missed, please leave it in a comment below so that I can improve and others can see it. Also, this video was sponsored by Royal Art. If you liked it, please thank the devs for hiring me to do it because sponsors are the main way this channel makes money. Alright guys, I'll see you next time.